Grigory Konstantinovich Orjanakidze, better known by the name Sergo, was a man of many different titles, committees, and military roles, but his greatest impact on history would come from his work as a key member of Stalin's inner circle. Yet, despite being trusted with the most important jobs and elevated to positions of great power, it was Sergo's sincerity that made his story different from that of an unquestioning lackey. He fought fiercely for a vision he truly believed in. He was incredibly loyal to those who he believed were his friends. He stuck to his own values in defiance of a tyrant. In the end, he would pay the price for all of it. On the 12th of October, 1886, Sergo Orjanikidze was born as Grigory Konstantinovich Orjanikidze in the Georgian region of Emireti, part of the Russian Empire at the time. Although a descendant of Georgian nobility, Grigory grew up poor and would be orphaned before his 11th birthday. Despite receiving only a few years of elementary education, Grigory would enter the study of medicine, beginning his studies at the Tbilisi Medical School in 1901. It was at this medical school, in the year of 1903, when he would first encounter socialism, a promising new ideology that a man like Grigory was naturally attracted to. He would join the Russian Social Democratic Labor Party in its early years and would attend the party's second congress. In 1905, Grigory would graduate medical school both as a doctor and as a new, optimistic revolutionary. Much like the rest of the men who would later become the old guard of the USSR's politics, Orjanikidze would have his life become a whirlwind of exiles, arrests, international travel, and daring escapes during the years before the revolution. After a few months of working as a paramedic, he involved himself in revolutionary efforts in the Caucasus region. In December of 1905, Grigori was arrested for transporting weapons in order to aid a Bolshevik peasant uprising, but was released the following year. After regaining his freedom, he promptly fled to Germany. This was by no means the end of his revolutionary activities though, and by 1907 he was back causing trouble in the Russian Empire's Caucasian territories, working to advance his cause in the city of Baku. As a leader of the local branch of the RSDLP, Orjanikidze spread socialism among those who worked the region's valuable oil fields. There were several other socialist revolutionaries who were also in the city at the time, but Orjanikidze would most notably make friends with two young men, Clement Voroshilov and Joseph Jugashvili, who had adopted the alias Koba. Grigory would become particularly close with Koba, who, like the folk hero he was named after, was a fellow Georgian. Orjanikidze would be arrested again in 1909 and was sent to Siberia, but managed to escape shortly afterwards. He then fled to Persia, where he would take part in its constitutional revolution. In 1911, Orjanikidze interrupted his work in the field to study in Lenin's social school in the Parisian commune of Longjumeau and entered the central committee of the RSDLP in the following year. After the school closed, he returned to Russia and resumed his subversive activities in St. Petersburg working with the previously acquainted Koba and another socialist by the name of Roman Malinovsky. However, neither Orjanikidze nor Koba would have guessed that the seemingly loyal Bolshevik Malinovsky was, in reality, a spy working for the Tsar's secret police. Unknowingly betrayed, Orjanikidze was again arrested. After performing hard labor for three years, he was sent off to Siberia where he worked as a doctor. Orjanikidze would again taste freedom after the Tsar was deposed in February of 1917 and he returned to St. Petersburg, now renamed Petrograd. The capital of the nation at the time, the city was the home of the two fledgling governments hoping to replace the Tsar, a cabinet of ministers known as the Provisional Government, and the Petrograd Council of Workers and Soldiers Deputies. Lenin, having recently returned to Russia from exile, began to establish a Bolshevik majority in the Petrograd Council with the eventual aim of absorbing the provisional government and taking complete control of the nation. To this end, the trusted Bolshevik Sergo was made a member of the council's executive committee. Once the October Revolution took place, the nation finally disintegrated. As Russia began to tear itself apart in one of history's most complex military conflicts, Orjanikidze was briefly assigned to the Bolshevik secret police and then assigned as the extraordinary commissar for Ukraine. But his next job, establishing Bolshevik control over the Caucasus, would have the biggest impact on his legacy. Taking advantage of the chaos in Russia, Georgia, Armenia, and Azerbaijan had collectively seceded as the Transcaucasian Federation 
but soon decided to split into three independent socialist republics. Under the guidance of Koba, who had now renamed himself Stalin, Rojanakidze led a series of brutal military invasions in the region that would snuff out the sovereignty of three of the would-be independent countries. The first to fall was Azerbaijan, its government overthrown in a matter of days with Sergo's military support. Armenia would be just as quick to lose its independence when invaded, and as Ojanakidze's forces occupied his old home of Tbilisi, he rejoiced in a telegram to Lenin and Stalin that the red flag flew over the capital of his homeland. Sergo's military conquest might have been complete, but the ideological struggle that would take place in Georgia would prove to be much tougher than the armed resistance. His next job was to unite these Caucasian countries into one Soviet Republic, the Transcaucasian SFSR, with the eventual aim of merging it into a Soviet Union under Lenin's control. It goes without saying that his attempt to strip his country of its political autonomy again, not to forget his military invasion, made him none too popular with his fellow Georgians, who gave him the not so affectionate nickname Stalin's Ars. This hostility manifested itself in his fiercest opponents in the Georgian Central Committee, who fought his actions every step of the way. The debates fought were less than civil, with Orjanakidze allegedly threatening a committee member with a knife, a paperweight, and execution. When these accusations, along with other complaints, reached the party leadership, Felix Dzerzhinsky, the head of the state political directorate and Sergo's old boss, launched an investigation into his behavior. As part of this investigation, Orjanakidze found himself meeting a man named Akaki Kabahidze, who accused him of corruption during this meeting, enraging him. Kabahidze's accusations were in fact unfounded, but Sergo didn't feel like giving an explanation. The only thing he would give Kabahidze that day was a good slapping. These anecdotes fit in with most accounts of Sergo's personality. He was generally known as irritable and had previously punched Vyacheslav Molotov, having to be restrained by his close friend Sergei Kirov. Sergo's wife, Zinaida, described the power of his emotions. He would give his life for the one he loved and shoot the one he hated. Yet despite his fiery reputation, he was generally beloved by his Moscow buddies, who still saw him as kind and worthy of respect, and called him the perfect Bolshevik. It was only due to the direct intervention of these Moscow buddies, particularly Lenin, that Sergo had not been run out of the entire country of Georgia in the first place, so naturally the investigation that was run by these Moscow buddies concluded that Orjanakidze did not make the threats against the committeemen, and four members of the Georgian Central Committee were also conveniently removed as a result. Sergo had shown that with the support of Lenin and Stalin, a man could make threats, stir up storms, and even slap a committee member without facing repercussions. It was no surprise, then, that in 1922, the Transcaucasian SFSR was finally born. He was installed to lead this new state as the first secretary of the Regional Party Committee from its establishment, and would keep this position until 1926. Civil War was ending, Stalin had set up his camp to have great influence in the southwest of the newly formed Soviet Union. Kirov in Azerbaijan, Voroshilov in the North Caucasus, the Armenian Mikoyan, the Ukrainian Kuranovich, and of course, the new leader of Transcaucasia, Sergo Orjanakidze. All having been given support and or central committee positions, it was now their turn to aid Stalin in his struggle and serve as his eyes and ears. Sergo, along with Voroshilov, was also one of the man's close personal friends, being among the few people in his sphere that he talked to informally. Sergo's value in Stalin's plans would increase even further with Felix Zerzhinsky's death in 1926. The former head of the Central Control Commission served as Felix's replacement as the Commissar of the Supreme Council of the Economy, leaving a vacancy for Sergo to fill. The Central Control Commission, which had been merged with the Workers' and Peasants' Inspectorate, was a commission for enforcing ideological discipline and managing corruption within the party. As the new head of this organization, Sergo was tasked with destroying the left opposition and did so with vigor. Many other friends of Stalin also experienced promotions at the same time, with Anastas Mikoyan being appointed as the Commission of Trade in place of the recently ousted Kamenev. After Zinoviev, one of Stalin's rivals, had his power removed, Rojanakidze, Mikoyan, Kirov, and Kuganovich also replaced opposition figures as candidates for the Politburo. Sergo would enter the Politburo as a non-voting member in 1926. It wasn't all good feelings within Stalin's camp though. At this point, Rojanakidze had become bitter enemies with another Georgian, Lavrenti Beria, who had his eyes on Sergo's position in the Caucasus. 
Sergo had been largely responsible for the success of Beria's career, and the two had a strong friendship at one point, with Beria even naming his son Sergo in honor of him. Despite all this, the sense of companionship had eventually soured into an intense and mutual hatred. When the first five-year plan started in 1928, Sergo was put in charge of organizing many of its largest projects. He would also be inducted into the Politburo as a full, voting member in 1930, and despite being brought on board as one of Stalin's boys, he would start getting into Uncle Joseph's way. One such incident would occur once Stalin had ousted Zinoviev, Kamenev, and Trotsky. Sergo, along with some other Stalin supporters, tried to show mercy to the great leader's failed rivals by arguing against their exile. In direct defiance of Stalin's will, and much to his annoyance, Rojana Kizia convinced the rest of the nation's top politicians that these three men should be allowed to stay. Something similar would happen in 1930, when the secret police started investigating Mikhail Tuhachevsky. Tuhachevsky was a young commander who, while revolutionizing the Soviet military, had managed to get himself on the bad side of both Stalin and Voroshilov. Stalin had developed a plot to arrest his old rival, but decided to consult his trusted friend first, testing to see if he could get away with it. When Sergo shut the plans down, Stalin realized that he did not yet have the support to be able to kill indiscriminately. From 1930 to 1932, Orjanikidze was the chairman of the Supreme Council of the National Economy. Afterwards, near the conclusion of Stalin's first five-year plan, Sergo was made the commissar for heavy industry. In these positions, Sergo began to establish research institutes and universities and utilize the rich natural resources of the USSR. Industrial plants began to spring up all over the country and massive and rapid growth was accomplished under Sergo's ruthless direction, even though some argue that this process was too costly in terms of lives and material. Naturally, as Orjana Kidze was given this job as a buddy of Stalin and not someone with a background in economics or industry, he relied heavily on his subordinates while protecting them from Stalin's bloodlust. One of his deputies, Yuri Pyatakov, was particularly responsible for the successes of Sergo's work. By its conclusion in 1933, the five-year plan had taken its toll on Orjanikidze, as well as the others who had worked alongside him. Most of the top brass of the party were now dealing with health conditions as a result of the strain of coordinating such a large project, including Sergo, who developed heart issues. As time passed, Orjanikidze continued to oppose Stalin's repressions. He often sided with Sergei Kirov, a close mutual friend of Stalin and Sergo, who opposed the rampant use of the death penalty and harsh punishment of dissent in the Soviet Union. The party witnessed the growing popularity of Kirov in particular, who, in his slight but increasing opposition of the general secretary, even began to rival him. He was winning elections. He challenged Stalin's ideas in public. The applause given to him was becoming just as loud as the applause given to him. On December 1st, 1934, at 4.30 p.m., Sergei Kirov would be shot and killed under murky circumstances, and upon hearing about the death of his friend, Sergei would collapse in grief. Soon, a meeting was held where Molotov, Zhdanov, Voroshilov, and Orjanikidze decided their course of action. Speeches would be delivered, a funeral was held, and Sergo would himself place Kirov's ashes in the Kremlin Wall necropolis, a site of rest reserved for the most respected and honored figures in the Soviet Union. Although it was and still is passionately debated among historians whether Stalin or other party members were complicit in Kirov's death, the demise of Sergo's close friend undoubtedly marks the beginning of this old revolutionary's own end. Because of Sergo's willingness to deviate from and even obstruct Stalin's plans, Lavrenti Beria had gradually become more favorable to Stalin and had begun to plant suspicions in him. Nothing demonstrated Beria's new power more simply than the death of Nestor Lakoba. Lakoba, the favorite of sick Bolsheviks looking for a getaway to the Caucasus, had been a majorly influential member of the Bolshevik inner circle and a Stalin supporter. On December 28, 1936, Nestor Lakoba died of what was officially reported to be a heart attack after visiting Beria in Tbilisi, but Stalin, the doctors who examined the body, and even Lakoba himself knew that he had, in reality, been poisoned. In the end, a member of Stalin's inner circle, so trusted that he had only months earlier been offered the job of heading the NKVD, now lay dead and denounced. No one was safe from Beria. Meanwhile, shortly after the trial of 16, the first of the Moscow trials that resulted from Kirov's suspicious assassination, Ojanakidze's vital deputy, Yuri Pyatikov, 
was arrested and accused of planning an overthrow of the government. Despite Orjanikidze's best efforts to protect him, Piatikov would confess after being interrogated by Nikolai Yezhov. Sergo could only watch as his comrade was ripped to pieces by the Politburo. Yet, still loyal to the party and trusting of Stalin, he eventually came to truly buy the accusations. The same year, Papulia Orjanikidze, Sergo's brother, would also be arrested. Another brother, Valiko Orjanikidze, lost his job not long later after maintaining Papulia's innocence. Sergo, believing that he was still close friends with Stalin, tried to intervene but realized that despite all of those long Soviet titles he had collected, he had lost all his power due to Beria eroding Stalin's trust in him. The NKVD would then search his house, leaving Orjanikidze baffled as he believed that he had always been loyal to Stalin. As a result of the stress, Orjanikidze suffered a heart attack on November 9th, 1936. Over the next three months, Sergo would come to the realization that he had fallen out of Stalin's favor. He wasn't alone in this knowledge. In early 1937, fellow party members, although still holding Sergo in reverence, became increasingly aware that Stalin saw Orjanikidze as an obstacle, as Stalin would begin to openly criticize his old friend in meetings. The NKVD searched Sergo's house again on February 17th, 1937, leaving him distraught. On the afternoon of the 18th, Sergo's wife Zenaida would find her husband dead after hearing a dull thud from his room. Son, Molotov, Zhdanov, and Voroshilov would gather in Sergo's house to decide their course of action. Speeches would be delivered, a funeral was held, and Stalin himself would place Sergo's ashes in the Kremlin wall necropolis. The cause of his death was initially reported as a result of another heart attack, even though the real cause of death was a self-inflicted bullet wound. The doctors who corroborated the official narrative mysteriously died not long after. Cities and institutions were named after him, and statues of him were built in cities like Magnitogorsk, Chelyabinsk, Ekaterinburg, and Leningrad. Despite being treated and remembered as a hero, Orjanikidze's family was imprisoned and shot, and Stalin's full wrath was brought down upon those whose Sergo had previously protected. In private, Stalin would continue to criticize the man who had once been his old, hopelessly loyal friend. A decade after his death, Orjanikidze's name would again echo about the Soviet Union's highest political circles. This time, poetically, it was him who would play a role in Beria's undoing. During the struggle to replace Stalin, the fact that Beria was responsible for the demise of Sergo, who had conveniently gone back from being a taboo topic to the beloved perfect Bolshevik, had become a liability. And so, during the ambush of accusations presented to Lavrenti Beria at his 1953 trial, Voroshilov would pile on the downfall of Orjanikidze, the faithful communist, as another one of Beria's crimes. Never mind that Voroshilov himself had stood by while Sergo lost everything, that he watched the destruction of his family, and that he had allowed his name to be dragged in private, Beria had to be shot and Sergo's name could do it. Though Grigory Konstantinovich Orjanikidze might not have been aware of it, Though he might have believed in everything he fought for and might have had his own set of morals, he was ultimately a tool. He was Stalin's vassal in the Caucasus. He was a loyal pair of hands to be assigned to high positions. Even his very death was used to drag down political enemies after Stalin was no more. Perhaps he was the perfect Bolshevik after all. Thanks for watching if you've made it this far without any Subway Surfers gameplay in the corner. Uh, I've also been working on a video about Kerensky and Kornilov, a sort of two-in-one if you will, so stay tuned for that. Bye.